you know, the classically trained letterpress printers were, were not trying to achieve that deboss necessarily. They just wanted the printed ink on the page. Um, I'm totally on team smash the crap out of it. <laughs> I want to be able to hang out in that divot. Um, <laughs> what's your, what's your take on the deboss? Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, we've got our first ever, I mean, I think it's our first ever. Once you're past 150 episodes, I think you have the right to forget some of this stuff. But I think today is the first ever letterpress designer and printer. His name is James Tucker. You guys may not know this, but I got my start in a very print-oriented design role or two, and I've had the pleasure of producing a few letterpress projects. I've never run a letterpress myself, but it is one of my favorite design touches. Today, we're going to nerd out a little bit with James about all things letterpress and why we still might be thinking about it going into 2021. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with James Tucker. Okay, kids, all the way from San Francisco, California, please welcome James Tucker. James, welcome to Obsessed Show. Hey. <laughs> Who's that masked man? <laughs> Good meeting you, Josh. I'm in the hallway, so uh, there's going to be some uh, parts going through, but... We're all here. The presses are running in the shop, so uh, it's a little too noisy to be in there right now, but it's great being here. Um, thanks for having me. And uh, you're correct. I am a letterpress printer <laughs> and a designer. <laughs> <laughs> and I think our very first one on the show. So yeah, that's very uh, first one. You know, we've had branding folks and web design and UI, UX and interior. Whatever, yeah. But like, just listening to past episodes, I'm, I'm, I'm super impressed by by everyone that's been on here and just like blown away. Like um, <laughs> I can't even like there are realms that I can't even imagine uh, doing. So, and I'm just like focused on my little thing, which is really good. You know, sometimes you just want to be focused on a little thing. You get really good at it if you're focused on a little thing. So um, that's what I've been doing all this time. So, nice. Yeah. Well um, we, you at least made reference to the mask and people going by. I mean, you're in San Francisco. It's towards the end of 2020. Your episode will go live early 2021. How are things right now? What's, what's the state of San Francisco and COVID life? State of San Francisco, you know, we're kind of used to it now. We're one of the first cities to shelter in place and shut down and stuff like that. We're good at following directions for San Francisco. Our, our rates have always been pretty low, but like there's always been uh, like rules in intact, you know, um, yeah. I actually share the building with, uh, Tartine bakery, um, and heat ceramics and a couple other small businesses as well. And they're much larger companies than mine. Um, Tartine's a restaurant, of course. So they have a whole other standard and rules and heat ceramics is actually manufacturing, uh, tiles in their ceramic factory. So they have like 50 workers in there during the day. Um, so all that access has been, it's just been a total shift in dynamics in the, uh, the whole building. So the building is one thing. And then the city is another thing, you know, the city sort of like New York city, one of your past guests was referencing, you know, city New York has been a, uh, a, like kind of a very social hub, but then, you know, it just like shut down, you know, and that was sort of like San Francisco too. We're, we're seeing a little more people on the streets and stuff like that, but yeah. it's, it's dramatic drop and all of that sort of stuff, which is, which is a shame, especially, you know, my shop is very physical, you know, it relies on people kind of coming in and seeing. And so when people can't come in and see, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like, it tough. might as well work in a basement. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Well, I want to dig into that a little bit further, but maybe we can rewind a little bit and talk a little mm -hmm. bit about your origin story. So, um, you know, this is not a, a super typical path. How'd you find yourself in the world of letterpress or what, what led you to this, uh, as a career? Yeah. So, um, I've always been a hands-on person. I grew up in Jersey on the shore. Um, my grandparents had a Christmas tree farm, grew up there. So it's always been they had a barn there and it was always like a center of community for people to come in, mm -hmm. stop by. I mean, it was just 
whoever was there, not even people who worked there, just hang out around the fire and just do it. So I really like that sense of community. Um, I was raised uh, to really uh, to draw a lot and stuff like that. So when I got to school, I kind of excelled at that and just sucked at everything else. And uh, <laughs> luckily, I wound up in a um, vocational school instead of high school for graphic design. And that's really I, where I learned like all the Adobe products and stuff. Mm-hmm. This amazing uh, graphic designer who worked in uh, Atlantic City of all places as a female graphic designer in the 80s. So you can't even imagine that. Um, but, um, she was great and she taught me everything, got me ready to go to college. I went over to, um, graduated with a degree in printmaking actually at Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore, a uh, great school. They let me take a bunch of graphic design classes. I, I got to know uh, so many influential designers like Ellen Lupton, um, mm. and, um, the guys from house industries. Uh, actually taught me my t- my typography classes because they're right <laughs> in Delaware, so cool. <laughs> and I still talk to them. They still do stuff with heat ceramics, so it's like I see them like almost every year. Not this year, but um, so it's just a great group of people, and they o- always appreciated. Like I knew my path was printmaking slash like letterpress or screen printing, you know, something hands on physical. Um, but I knew that was going to take a lot of graphic design knowledge um, because I wanted to make stuff that look good and honestly i wasn't seeing a lot of stuff that like looked good there was a lot of crafty stuff but the people i was impressed with were like old school printers like hat show print in nashville which i had an internship uh when i was in college which was awesome but they're very old school you know they made the first elvis posters and circus mm-hmm. posters and stuff like that so so i took as many graph design classes as i could i learned from the best you know ellen uh, lupton and, and house and stuff like that and then um moved over to San Francisco. Cause I was like, I want to start my own shop. I knew I want to create a community hub. So I knew I wanted to start my own shop. I knew I didn't have enough training in business or letterpress. I knew how to make good art stuff. Um, and I knew the craft really well. So I moved to San Francisco cause the weather was great. It's much better than Jersey and Baltimore. And, um, I could live cheaply at the time. And, um, I had a friend here, so she let me sleep on her couch for a month. And then I, you know, uh, that's a phrase that nobody has uttered in the last 10 years is moved to right? San Francisco. Cause you can leave, live cheaply. <laughs> I know. But in 2007, it was like, Oh, like it was, it was slightly less expensive than New York city. I moved yeah. right at the right time. So I got a job at a book bindery and then a letterpress company. So always hands on. Um, and then I got like a cheap apartment and just kind of kept moving around. Um, all that while in the back of my mind, like hey, I'm saving money. I, I like lived on a boat for a while. I lived out of a van for a while, just like save it all. And then I started a, a Tumblr before there was Instagram called the aesthetic union. And, uh, I was just doing a bunch of print projects after hours for a bunch of friends, um, starting businesses at the time. Um, and just gathering good, like work that way. And really like, uh, working at this print shop during the day, I was printing wedding invitations and greeting cards and just stuff I didn't like, but at least I knew like how to work presses and I knew about business. Um, so I got laid off there (laughs) eventually during the great recession. Stay. I lived on a boat I bought from like the 1920s, which was fun. And I sailed for a living. I worked at the maritime museum here in San Francisco. Um, And then Heath Ceramics, who I mentioned before, uh, they started in the 1940s in Sausalito, right across the Golden Gate Bridge. They bought an old factory in San Francisco in 2012, and they wanted um, other craftspeople to move in and uh, kind of inhabit these little spaces around it just to create more of a cultural community. So I met with them. You know, I was like, especially in 2013, I was like, how much is the rent? Luckily, they were like mm-hmm. below market rate. <laughs> <laughs> we just want you in here, you know, which was awesome. So I um, got together all the money I had, all the friends I had. I had a bunch of skills. We built it. It was like a barn raising, but like a print shop. Um, I uh, I got the press I had in a in a garage. I, I bought stuff from like Blick. I drew a 
table for our, I dragged a table from the street to like the retail spot. I didn't know anything about business. I just knew what I knew what I wanted to do. And then I just started, I opened up the shop 2013, December. Uh, and then I, I was like, I have a bunch of friends that want prints. They can't afford anything. So I'm just going to like print and have a show and then we'll split the profits. Mm -hmm. And I just kept having show after show, having massive parties in the space. That's something you don't hear about any, anymore. <laughs> massive parties. We had like 300 people in like 1700 square feet with all these presses and stuff and a DJ and just selling out print shows. Um, and then I started doing more design and stuff like that. And just kind of like snowballed from there. You know, I had a lot of, a lot of hard times, a lot of good times, but like, just like hanging, living by the edge of my seat, even this year, you know, <laughs> right. um, but it's a very, it's a very atypical story. I think for, um, you know, maybe a letterpress shop, but definitely a design shop too. We do a lot of design now, which is fun. Um, I print a lot of my own art prints, which is awesome. I do a little less collaboration just because I want to make sure like each one is like, just perfect. Um, I have four employees now and uh, started this on my own. So that's, that's always great too. So um, it's kind of my little origin story. Yeah. I, backstory. That's really cool. I think our listeners frequently enjoy the um, <clears throat> kind of the scale up or why stay small oh, uh, yeah. discussion. So you've got four employees now. Um, like, are, is, are you holding it for, uh, yeah. plans for world domination? For what, what's it look like? <laughs> no world domination. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't start this shop to, to, to make a lot of money. Right. Like I'm happy getting paid what I get, you know, and, um, everyone else gets paid what they get too. It's, um, we're actually thinking of just turning into like a, a worker owned business too, and just kind of sp splitting the profits at the end of the year, because it, it's what I've realized over the years. It's really, it's not about me, you know, like, yeah, I had the idea. I had the tenacity to sleep on a cot in a shop for a couple months, but like, I'm not asking uh, 10. <laughs> See, this is what happens when you go to shop. And, um, <laughs> And, uh, they, uh, yeah, they do so much. Like they just, you know, they asked me how much this print was just now. They do so much that, so the shop is not just me anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's my idea, but it's also them. They've been working for me for long as it's been five years or something. So like, they're not doing it to get rich either. They're doing it because they need a job or I think one of the last letterpress shops in San Francisco, I moved here when I was 20. I really don't want to grow. I want to provide a, a service to the community. Uh, I want to make some really cool stuff. I could see having a private studio somewhere, but two in, in inclusion with the shop, but like, I'm not looking to scale up and become the next moo or like Vista print. Yeah. If they still exist. <laughs> I don't know. That's sure. a good question. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, my guess is letterpress, um, you know, is not the, not the fastest, not the most efficient, not the cheapest route to take. Um, <clears throat> so what's, what's the thing about letterpress and maybe it'd be helpful as part of this answer. Um, there might be listeners going, I think I know what letterpress is. I've heard of that, but I'm not sure if I would know how to tell the difference. Like what is it about letterpress that draws people in and what is it? <clears throat> I mean, it's in your name, the aesthetic union, but yeah. like, what's the aesthetic of that that is so different? Yeah. So letterpress is, um, it's an old printing process just to give a quick history lesson. I'm not a historian, but, uh, <laughs> this guy, so in the beginning, the, uh, kind of Koreans invented the uh, woodblock printing, right? It's inking up a raised surface and pre pressing that raised surface into a piece of paper. Fast forward to 1500 Gutenberg invents the printing press, which looks like a wine press, big clamp that goes down and uh, invents movable type, right? Latin um, was a much more, uh, it was a smaller alphabet than uh, I guess early Korean. So you can make movable mm -hmm. letters and yeah. make a sign with that. And then he also invented ink that would stay on top of the letters too, uh, oil-based ink. Um, so you're, you're inking up a raised surface, pressing that raised surface into a piece of paper. 
that leaves an indentation or uh, what we call a deboss in the industry. So when you see those kind of beautiful, like incised le letters into a piece of paper, that's a deboss. Um, you know, over the years, letterpress equipment has improved, um, but they stopped making it. So like in the 1970s, that's when offset printing and then digital offset printing supplanted that, um, you know, technology has really improved improved but has less left letterpress printing um kind of in the dust for the commercial aspect mm -hmm. in, in that realm but um all these presses were like thrown out in the uh the 70s and 60s and stuff and all these artists started getting them and and uh, just on the street and just bringing them into their houses and using them to print uh, art books and different things. There's always been still like one letterpress shop in a town that would, could still do all this stuff for, for you, including like foil stamping. So all the foil mm. stamping you see on labels and stuff like that, that's all letterpress. Um, so you get all this texture, you get something that's handmade. It's, it's, it's the same kind of bespokeness if, if you got something custom made like a suit or a pair of boots or if you go into a fancy restaurant, it's going to take a little longer. You're going to pay more, but you're really getting the quality and you're really supporting a community and you're supporting the, um, the characteristics of the city uh, or the town or whatever. And you're also supporting the craft too. So yeah, it takes a little longer. It's more expensive. We use older machines, um, which are beautiful. Um, that's what, that's what's great about letterpress. Um, and that's, what's different about, about it with, uh, modern digital stuff too. Well, it's my understanding that, um, you know, the classically trained letterpress printers were, were not trying to achieve that deboss necessarily. They just wanted the printed ink on the page. Um, I'm totally on team smash the crap out of it. <laughs> I want to be able to hang out in that divot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what's your what's your take on the deboss um that was the that's that was the hot take the hot take on the deboss um <laughs> so the the cool thing about letterpress printing is like all the equipment is old but it's not that we don't use new technology i'm still designing so much in illustrator and so mm -hmm. much um with all of that and we're actually instead of just using that those lead um, pieces, uh, lead letters that Gutenberg invented or wood type. We're using, um, a light sensitive photopolymer right now to create our printing plates. So that's like extremely hard. It's so much harder than lead that those old people, <laughs> old guys, mostly that s say, Hey, you should just like kiss impression the paper we're using lead type or wood type. So they didn't want to damage their type. So it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. But now we have photopolymer. We can smash the hell. We can do whatever the hell we want with, with printing um, and still have it hold up. So the cool thing is, is we're using a lot of new technology with letterpress printing. Um, that's kind of what we're known for with the aesthetic union is like trying new weird shit that most letterpress printers won't use. Um, and we're small enough to like, I'll take a financial hit if it doesn't work out, <laughs> but, but you know, and my open, open mindedness too, right. There's a, there's still those old guys that believe that. And yeah, it has its place. You know, if you're printing a book and it's double-sided, you don't want to see the other imp yeah, right. impression on the other side. But if you're printing a poster, like smash the hell out of it, do some cool stuff on it, do an ombre effect, do like a split fountain, like roll. Yeah. I think that stuff's really cool. Uh, you don't see that a lot, but um, I'm, I'm for team D boss for sure. Or team, team, do whatever you want. Just don't <laughs> complain when I do something. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, <clears throat> what's other, what are some of the other weird different things that you guys are experimenting with? Um, doing so like using that raised surface to print off of, yeah, you could use wood type, lead type. I, I do a lot of hand cut it like linoleum or mm. uh, wood block printing as well. Um, Ciano type exposure. So kind of a photographic process. Uh, we use uh, digital printing and letterpress together, screen printing and letterpress together. We've um, 
kind of on the back end thing to repair these old machines. We've like digitally scanned parts and then 3D mm. printed the parts to like repair the presses because sometimes oh, there's cool. no parts around. Um, you know, all that stuff. And also like using social media and being savvy with that. I'm always trying to hire young people <laughs> to be <laughs> and not be scared of, of TikTok and stuff like that to, to help. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's using technology in a lot of ways um, to help the business. Um, CNC uh, routing too, which is really cool, which mm-hmm. you can make like huge like wood blocks with. And I can print on like a big etching press. So um, yeah, anything. We'll, we'll throw it on the press. You name it. We'll throw it on the press and try to print off of it. I've, threw, I've, I've print off like a pair of jeans before. Oh, nice. Um, and that, that looks really crazy. So. <laughs> nice. Well, I know you, you had mentioned um, before we chatted about working with clients like your, um, your sweet mates, Heath Ceramics and Tartine and, and even big brands like Everlane. Mm-hmm. Um, what is it about um, big companies that are interested in letterpress and, and how do you, how do you market yourself to, to reach these kind of big companies? Um, I think the cool thing about big companies is like, like I think Everlane is definitely different than Heath Ceramics where Heath Ceramics is more like a craft company. So they're coming to us with almost the same eye as we're approaching the craft. Whereas like Everlane, yeah, they're, you know, they're doing what they do, but they have like a, their audience is much wider so we can educate. So like education is such a huge part of this process. Um, like almost every client that comes in, I have to, you know, correct them when they say emboss, they always want to emboss. I'm like, eh, it's deboss, but I get what you mean, you know, like, yeah. or, uh, you know, showing the letter pressing, you know, I do a lot of, I talk a lot about it because I love it so much, but because I want to share and spread the word, you know, I'm like a preacher. I'm like a letterpress preacher. (laughs) And, uh, you know, so it's like, so it's like, um, I'm just trying to spread the word here with what we do and like why it's still important and why we should like preserve and why people should spend the money on something like this with us. So yeah. Well, you've kind of talked around this answer a little bit, but I'm curious to hear um, what a typical day might look like for you, because it sounds like you're everywhere from in the software to on the presses and, you know, and pitching this to clients. So what, what, what's kind of your mix of roles? Yeah. Um, I'll start at the beginning of my day. I wake up. <laughs> That's always really important. Right. Yes. Um, and also like I, I became a letterpress printer and and I became my own boss because I want to like love going to work every day. I never want to like dread it. So I like going to work, you know, wake up and I can bike to work or I can walk to work. Right. I always wanted to live in a place where I can either do, you know, either one. Um, so that's really important to me. But after I get here, like I'm just checking in, like trying to check in with my employees, see what's going on. You know, I usually get them coffee or get myself coffee too. Um, at like the coffee shop down the street, you know, establish that relationship more. So it is, it's like, like about half the day is just about establishing and strengthening relationships with different people, whether it be um, my neighbors or um, my employees or um, clients, you know, sending emails, calling them, texting them, just being like, Hey, how are you doing? Oh, this is on press for you. You know, you want to come in look at it or you want us to just roll with it. Um, trying to get new business, you know, like we do a lot of stuff with like, uh, we do a lot of additions with different artists and we give them like a really good deal, you know? So I reach out to any artists that I like and see if they want to make an addition and, uh, really talk to them about that. Um, and then like the rest of the day is, is like setting up some files. Of course we have like, I have an employee doing that too, but I check in and make sure they need any help. Um, and then uh, I design my own stuff. 
And then usually the rest, like the last half of the day, I'm on press. So um, I'm printing something. I'm printing my own work usually. Um, William, who's our pressman, prints a lot of the custom work. He's just great. So precise. He's, he's a better printer than I am. So like, I, I'm so glad he's printing stuff. And, uh, and since my, like the presses I use are in the front of the shop and we have a small retail section in the front of the shop, mm -hmm. I'm usually talking to people too. So I'm making more connections. So I'm just like constantly just making these connections of, uh, and, and rolling the press uh, with one arm and talking with the other. So, you know, um, it's, yeah, I think I spent most of the day doing that. And like, and then I usually stay until like eight or nine o'clock and, uh, print when the doors are closed so I can actually get some work done. <laughs> right. <laughs> Once all the, the people to talk to are gone. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> what do you think is, um, one of your proudest professional moments? Oh man. Um, Oh, the first time I fired a client, I think. Yeah. It was kind of like, <laughs> I, I, I got, it's like, you know, you turn that corner when you like need the money so bad, you're willing to uh, have some sort of like disrespect for yourself going on. Yeah. And then you realize that it's not worth it. Like you have five other people behind them trying to get their stuff. And you're just like, you're being an extreme pain in the ass and you're treating like the person I'm working with like shit. And, zero tolerance uh-uh yeah i warned you you can go somewhere else oh we're the last letter press printers in san francisco oh too bad <laughs> probably the best probably the really? my proudest moment in like <laughs> bosshood and also uh being a printer is, is firing bad clients <laughs> my first bad client <laughs> it's a good feeling yeah it's a good feeling it's good for everybody um <laughs> it's probably good for them you know it is. I think it's good for them. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm happy about it, but I'm not like, I would hate to see him on the street. Cause then, you know, I have to deal with that shit. California is a totally different thing when it comes with, comes to confrontation. But, uh, uh, yeah, I am. I'm, you know, I'm, pr I'm proud of that. Yeah. Do you have any, um, design heroes? And I'm curious if these are like graphic design heroes or, print design heroes or print operators yeah. or I mean I, I mentioned I mentioned like the guys from house industries like Andy Cruz mm. and um and Ken Barber and stuff like that they're amazing um they were such a champions of of me like taking graphic design classes while being a printmaker that it really inspired me and pushed me harder than I probably pushed myself so those guys are just like, I mean, I still get like starstruck seeing them, even though I know them, you know? Um, but like, other than that, I mean, like I, I love, uh, I've been really loving uh, Karita Kent, who was actually a nun in the sixties. And she did mm -hmm. a bunch of screen printing with like her community in the sixties and seventies. It was like a lot of political, but it was almost like Andy Warhol meets like a bunch of nuns screen printing in a factory somewhere. Oh wow! It's so cool. If you haven't seen her stuff, you can check it out. Yeah, say her name um, again. Karita Kent. Karita Kent. Yeah, and now there's a Karita Kent Center in LA. She was working in LA. Um, and then there's other people too. Like I, when I was uh, doing my uh, internship and apprenticeship at uh, Hat Show Print in Nashville, um, there was this guy uh, Jim Sheridan who, um, really brought hat show print from an obscure um letterpress shop in nashville to um some like some sort of like cool experimental letterpress shop. so like mm -hmm. he's an amazing guy and really a hero of mine too and he's still doing work i don't think he's associated with hatch anymore but he's making some really cool letterpress art um so those are like my design heroes. I mean, I have lots of others, like of course, Ray and Charles Eames and stuff like that, but I mentioned those guys cause you, you never hear about, you know, printers. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I think Jim was the guy that I saw speak 
um, here in Indy. This is many years ago and picked up, he had a bunch of hatch sample prints with him. So still got a couple of those kind of in the house, which is pretty cool. Yeah. He was doing the circuit for the, for a while, which was really cool. Um, yeah, really cool guy. So this is the question that I ask everybody. What is it, and it could be in life or in printing or in coffee shops or whatever, but what do you find that you are most obsessed with right now? Uh, I'm most obsessed with, I thought about this one. (laughs) I have have the question. Uh, I'm most obsessed with right now is just like fine tuning the business because it's, it's, it's such a weird time right now Mm -hmm. that and I have such like clarity when it comes to um, analytics and stuff like that. When I look on the back end, like I said, we use a lot of software and things and um, that I'm just so, I'm so obsessed with just figuring out what's the most effective and efficient way of doing this business stuff. So I don't have to worry about that side, yeah. like business stuff. Cool. Yeah. I like making friends and I like printing for them, but like the whole financial stuff, whatever. But so I'm like obsessed with it right now, just trying to fine tune that. I know that's kind of boring um, and maybe not so designery, but that's what I'm into right now. It's just this yeah. other part of my brain. <clears throat> well, Hey, if, if the business piece doesn't work, it's hard to make the friends and printing for people. I think. I think so. And I think that's kind of like a, a kind of like a running joke right now is like the reason why we're successful is because we actually answer your emails back. I mean, there's so many, <laughs> there's so many artists and there's so many printers that just the drop the is ball. Low, as we say. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I'm, I was trying to print a book last year and it was just like trying to pull teeth with these printers. And I'm like, Turn to my project manager. I'm like, I'm so happy to have you. <laughs> right. Tell it's me us. this is not what it's like working with us because. Seriously. No, problems. it's not at all. Yeah. Um, what about dream projects? Anything that you haven't worked on yet that you'd like to do? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I worked with like, it's so cool. Cause like, just like out of the blue, I'll just work with like a hero of mine or work with someone I always wanted to work with. Um, sometimes it's not as good as I hope, which is a good lesson. Um, right. but I'd really, yeah, I don't, I don't really know. I'd love to like, I'd love to work on something like, uh, design a physical space again. Mm. And I know I'm not qualified architecturally or anything like Mm -hmm. that, but I'd love to have some input in a physical space. I really love physical space. I've designed my shop, um, but it's, but I'd love to be like part of a team just to do that. Um, I think that would be so cool. I'd love to design another factory that was like (laughs) production, but also like good like design and production. Um, I think that would be so cool. Uh, Yeah. So we talked a little bit already about, um, you know, in terms of like a client that doesn't go well, they're not treating you well, or they're not respecting the people they're working with. Are are there other red flags that you watch out for? Or um, if you feel like you've already covered that, then tell me about kind of what you do when you, (laughs) when you're stuck and things aren't going well. Yeah, I, I think I think that when things are stuck and not going so well, I think taking a step back is always great. Um, usually, it's miscommunication um, between the client and us, or it rarely happens anymore. It, it happened much more like when I first started because I was just trying to do way too many things. Um, there's very few times that we actually fire a client and because it's very intentional on the client's part to be disruptive to us. But Mm -hmm. um, more often than not, it's just, yeah, we got to take a step back and just be like, okay, let's just take a break for a week. 
tell a client that, Hey, we're just going to like, think about this, you know, assess with my team, see what's going on, just like sift through all the information and then get back to them. And then usually there's some kind of solution. Like there's like a puzzle part missing Mm -hmm. that either they're not providing or we're not providing. Um, But yeah, in those few instances when it's just like, we work with a lot of people who's like, this is their first time coming uh, to someone to get something designed. So they're, they're not really like sure what's happening. So we just try to, we have like different tiers. We have like, if we're working with like a design firm, to do some mm-hmm. design, yeah. we'll have like the, the upper tier. They know what they're doing, right? Yeah. If, if it's like the first time person coming in, we'll have like, here's your menu. You have to choose sort of custom, right? It's like, <laughs> right. it's like made to measure. Um, and uh, yeah, I feel like that kind of like adjustment mentally for us is important to, to avoid sticky situations with clients. Yeah. So, um, one of the questions that you, you told me before the top of the show that you were excited about answering was this <laughs> blessed or ruined question. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> it's just like, you know, designers, we look around at the world and we see all kinds of crazy things going on, whether it's trends or whatnot. And, you know, sometimes it's a blessing and sometimes it's cursed. Like what, what are you noticing right now? You know, I, Yeah. <laughs> How am I get in trouble saying this? I get some angry DMs. Um, but you know, I'm a big fan of like honest materials. You know, um, you know, if it's gonna be made out of concrete, don't just try to dress it up as wood. You know, it's concrete. Just give us the concrete. Um <clears throat> there's this trend in Instagram right now that's like there's a lot of designers that are just pumping out designs, doing stuff on Photoshop and just like applying like the letterpress filter or something. It looks like it's just printed, it's like mm-hmm. sort of transparent. There's some like shit on the background that looks like you're using a natural paper. You're not <laughs> fooling anybody. Sorry, but you're, you're, you're doing a disservice to yourself, your audience, and also me who's printing like the real stuff, you know? Um, sure. There's a thing called mock-ups and I understand that you know, it's good. And those, those designs would look really good printed on paper, but take some time and like learn the craft, you know? Yeah. Using, um, using technology is definitely a craft, but I always say like, don't use that craft. Don't use technology as a crutch, you know, um, use it as a tool and use it as a tool to make other stuff. Don't let it be the end. Um, you know, let it serve you. Uh, and that's kind of my, like, that's my pet peeve right now. That's my ruin. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, if you weren't doing this, if you weren't printing and designing, what do you think you'd be doing right now? Um, it's funny. I put building a house. I like wrote, wrote down a bunch of notes and I was like, I'd probably be building a house or sailing or, walking i'd love to just take a walk a long walk and not worry about anything especially <laughs> after this year right like okay. walk without a mask somewhere you know um yeah i think that's what i would would be doing if i'm not designing i'm usually printing too so it's like i get a good i get a good balance in my everyday life but i'd love to just be off the screen for a good solid month that would be nice I think there yeah. are probably a lot of um, uh, traditional graphic designers listening who are jealous of the fact that like you get to get in there and do stuff with your hands too, that it's not just all screen time. Um, I'm curious where you go for inspiration. You know, you have that kind of natural back and forth, but um, where do you find things strike you? You know, I usually, we have some wonderful museums in San Francisco, like the SF MoMA and De Young and stuff. And I usually go to the museum to get inspired and just like looking at the past, right? Everything repeats itself in like 40 to 30 years or so. So you can like look at, look at something that's from the 1970s and 1980s and be like, oh, that's going to be hip two years from now. Let's yeah. start working on this. 
Um, but, um, you know, uh, so yeah, museums, people's past work, people's past graphic design. There's this great, um, archive called the letter form archive in San Francisco. That's so inspiring. So cool. Mm -hmm. If you're not aware of it, check it out as a graphic designer. It's a great resource. Um, but yeah, like I think past work is really inspiring to me right now, but also like, you know, like I just did a project, which was all about sidewalks with my friend, Julie. Mm -hmm. And like, we were just like inspired by <laughs> like the cuts and sidewalks that are ADA accessible now. So materials like that, I mean, the simplest things, you know, I, I write, I write a lot too. And I feel like the most successful writing is not about the big stuff. It's always about the little stuff. It's about mm -hmm. making tea in your house. You know, it's not about love. You know, leave that to Pablo Neruda. Like, don't, don't worry about that shit. Write about like the small stuff, design about the small stuff or get inspired by the small stuff. Like right now I'm like looking at this like concrete ledge that just like goes up perfectly at an angle. And like, I'm inspired by that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Don't sweat the big stuff. <laughs> Love it. Well, I was about to ask you if you had any advice that you liked to pass along or maybe favorite advice that you've received to be, uh, don't sweat the oh, big yeah. stuff is maybe a good place to start. <laughs> that's a good, I mean, that's a good, good, good form of advice. I think the, I think like a lot of designers and designers that I've worked with in school and out of school and stuff like that, they're, they're, everyone's very concerned about like making ends meet or making just like a ton of money to get out of the business or something like that. Like think of it more sustainable. It's definitely a marathon, not a sprint. Like, if you're upset at like spending so much time on the screen, do stuff with your hands. Why aren't you take, why aren't you doing some screen printing on the side? I'm sure yeah. you have enough money to buy a screen printing setup, you know, like work half a day. Like, yeah. Uh, the best advice that was ever given to me was everything I need will come to me. Mm -hmm. and maybe not everything I want. I'm not gonna, I don't know, get a new, I don't know, Land Rover or something or old Land Rover, but like, I'll probably get an old truck or something, you know, like, and it'll just like come to me. Like things will just like happen. Yeah. Still work for it. But like, we don't need all the same stuff. Um, so don't, don't sweat about the money, you know, make smart decisions, of course, but do what, do what makes you happy. Do what fulfills you. Um, there's no need to sacrifice. The only thing that that's, that's going to lead to is you regretting stuff on your deathbed. And that's probably the worst thing I can think of mm. in the world. Right. right. I want to feel like I lived like three lifetimes by the time I'm 80. <laughs> mm. That's good. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> well, before we left you go, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be pondering that feeling like I've lived three lifetimes by the time I'm 80 for probably the next week and a half. Um, I'm curious if you have any asks or encouragements for our listeners. Yeah. Um, probably like the biggest ask is like, be nice to your printer. <laughs> 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 Make some bumper stickers. Um, you know, like think of your graphic is your design, you know, especially if you're designing for print or for a billboard or for a sign or sign painting, like your work is not done until that craftsperson gets done with your design. So like, make sure you pick a good uh, craftsperson to help you um, bring it to life. Right. That's, that's kind of like where the name comes from is the aesthetic union is like, our aesthetics, like the designer and the craftsperson bring it together in a union to make a complete product. It's not just all about design. It's not all about craft. It's not all about art. It's about the intersection of those things. And that's what really brings everything into real life. You need all those things to bring everything into real life. So just keep that in mind um, when you're designing something. That's all I ask. <laughs> Simple. <laughs> simple <laughs> just be nice to your printer sum it all up in that um well it's been awesome chatting with you today before we let you go tell our 
uh, listeners where they can find you guys online and learn more about the aesthetic union on the interwebs. Yeah, you can, you can find us on the aesthetic union.com. Of course, but we're also on Instagram at the aesthetic union. Um, very easy. And if you're in San Francisco, stop by, we're open five, five, five Alabama street connected to the Heath ceramics building and uh, get yourself a, a piece of bread at Tartine play at ceramics at the ceramic shop and then a print from us and your uh, day will be set complete the whole set yeah um yeah and then in the not too distant future maybe another raging print show at your uh, <laughs> i can't wait club aesthetic so fun yeah <laughs> after hours <laughs> Awesome. Maybe that'll be part two of the interview. And so uh, then get back. We'll do the after hours interview. That'd be awesome. Well, James, thanks so much for being on the show today. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Josh. Yeah, it was a pleasure. And thank you for being obsessed with design. Of course, it's a curse. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, kids, that's episode number 155 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. And if you haven't already while you're there, add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.